Okay, I take that as five past. So that's the kind of general rule for all conference calls. So I'm going to officially welcome you all um, to Results UK's first um, Universal Health Coverage um, Day webinar. Um, I'm Laura Kerr, for those of you who don't know me, but I think most of you do. Um, and I'm the Senior Policy Advocacy Officer at Results UK. Um, so some of you might know that I kind of focus more of my work on child health and vaccines, but I'm also a passionate advocate for equitable access to um, all health services and delighted to be joining um, and chairing tonight's webinar with you all. So um, just to start with, a happy Universal Health Coverage Day to all. Um, it's an exciting day. It's the first time um, UHC Day has been officially recognised as a UN Day, um, which I think really shows the kind of growing political momentum um, towards this important issue. Um, so thank you so much for giving up your time to join us um, and to find out more about how we can ensure um, health for everyone everywhere. Um, so tonight we're going to hear from two expert speakers um, on turning this specific health um, goal into reality. Um, but before that, I wanted to say a few things about universal health coverage and results and why 2019 is shaping up to an important year um, for us and health for all. So. Um, as some of you might know, um, results uh, primarily focus our health work on vaccines, nutrition and tuberculosis. And we work on these areas because still there are too many children who miss out on vaccines, who are undernourished and too many people who are not diagnosed or don't have access to the treatment they need for tuberculosis. Um, these are all issues um, part of essential health services that could be addressed um, and afforded to everyone if we achieved universal health coverages. So. Universal health coverage is one of the main health targets and sustainable development goals. And by making progress on equitable access to all essential health services, we would drive progress not only on the issues that we at Results really care and focus on, but ensure overall everyone had comprehensive access to a whole range of health services that they need and deserve um, without financial hardship or without any barriers because of where they live or who they are. So we're really looking forward to 2019 as it provides a unique moment to build political momentum and accelerate progress towards ensuring everyone has access to those vital health services. So in September um, next year, um, just, just around the corner, there'll be a high level meeting on UHC taking place in New York. And we're hoping to see governments like the UK and some of the big health multilateral organizations, um, which some of you will be aware of that we work on like Gavi and the Global Fund, as well as governments around the world galvanizing on this moment to ensure firm commitments and actions for health for all. Um, but how we're going to achieve that is the big question. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about this evening. Um, so we're delighted that we're going to be joined by um, two experts we have, um, Rob and Jenny, who are going to focus on kind of where we are with UHC and how we drive political attention and commitments, um, which result in policies and programs, which do in fact drive better access to health services um, for everyone around the world. Um, so we're going to have two parts um, to our discussions tonight. Um, we're going to start with um, Rob Yates, who is um, certainly an internationally recognised expert on UHC and progressive health financing. Um, at Chatham House, he is the project director of the UHC Policy Forum, and his principal area of expertise is in the political economy of UHC, with a focus on advising political leaders and government ministries on how to plan, finance and implement national UHC reforms. So if anyone was going to tell us how we can make UHC a reality, definitely going to be Rob. Um, and he's worked previously as a senior health economist with the UK's Department for International Development, DFID, who you all know well, as well as WHO. So we're delighted to be joined by Rob. Um, so we're going to have our presentation last about 20 minutes. Uh, 25 but I'll be harsh on time and following that um, we're going to hear from Jenny Vaughan who is the advocacy officer at Stop AIDS um, who has a much trickier job um, of explaining how we can achieve UHC when we still have a lot of our individual priorities such as TB and HIV that deservedly still need our attention um, and Jenny's got a whole wealth of experience on campaigning at Progressio um, and an international development NGO, as well as forward an African women-led women rights organisation. Um, so I'm going to be pretty strict on time and I'm going to ask everyone to make sure you're on mute as we go through um, the presentations today. Feel free at any time to pop questions you have in the chat box um, and we're making sure we leave plenty of time at the end of today's webinar to make sure we can make sure your questions are answered 
um, and we have some sort of conclusions at the end about what we can potentially do going forward um, to help realise universal health coverage in 2019. Um, so um, in that regard and looking we've had a few more people kind of join since um, I welcomed everyone so if you've just joined thank you very much I can see Jill um, and a few others and um, welcome um, but so you don't have to listen to me and we get to hear from the experts I'm going to pass over to um, Rob just now so welcome Rob and thank you so much for joining us Great, thank you so much, Laura. Just checking that everyone can hear me and then happy uh, Universal Health Coverage Day to everyone. The very first UHC day, uh, momentous day. Six years ago, there was the UN declaration on universal health coverage. So that's why today's been chosen. And uh, a real privilege for me to be able to speak to uh, your members. Uh, oh, I can see someone's holding, Jill's holding up a, a, a results UHC. Banner, very good, excellent. Yeah, this is the type of advocacy that we want. Fantastic. Um, so I've got just one or two little slides here, which I'm hoping if I push the right buttons will now come up on your screen. Now, if I hit share, do you have slides? I can see everyone oh, I've got them loud and clear. Great, marvellous. Now, unfortunately, I, uh, I've got the pictures in front of me blocking my slides here, but I think I, think I can still remember them, so, so let, let, let's see. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's slightly annoying, though. Why has it done that? If I just... Uh, oh, God, I hope I don't click this and, and then everything disappears. Ah, yeah, that's good. Everyone, can everyone still see me? Yeah, we can see you, Rob. Good, good. Excellent, right. So, what is universal health coverage, to, to start us with? Just important that we get the definitions right, because some people... Uh, make assumptions about UHC all being about health insurance, which, which isn't the case. Uh, so here's a nice simple definition that's about all people receiving the quality health services they need without suffering financial hardship. So you can see there are sort of three bits to it really. The all, the universality, people receiving quality health services, now that's the complete range of services, we're not just talking about curative services, you know, but with preventive, promotive, rehabilitative and palliative care services as well. And then this very vital um, aspect of not suffering financial hardship, that people aren't plunged into poverty when they're accessing health care. Uh, right. Here we go. Yeah, good. So um, now from that definition, you can see very quickly you get into issues around equity and fairness and politics as well. And this is a good thing, you know, the, 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 uh, we have to recognize that universal health coverage really is all about equity. If we're talking about everyone on the planet being covered, getting uh, health coverage, nobody should be left behind. You know, you know this is part of the language of the SDGs. Um, so it's not acceptable to be talking about, well, we've got to 80, 90 percent coverage, but we're not covering migrants. We're not covering poor people. That's that's not universal health coverage. Another aspect that, that you know, demonstrates is about equity is we're talking about services allocated according to need. Now, obviously, some people need health care more than others. So pregnant women and children and people with disabilities and chronic illnesses they need more health care in a year than other people who are ostensibly healthier. And so they should get those services. We're not talking about everyone getting the same amount of health care every year. The financial protection aspect, um, if we're talking about nobody suffering financial hardship, then logically we're talking about a health financing system which is financed according to your ability to pay. Rich people need to be paying more into the system than poorer people. And you can combine those aspects, and really what you're talking about is healthy, wealthy people cross-subsidizing services for the sick and the poor. Now, it's important to stress that, that UHC isn't just about health financing. You've got to do all the other health systems as well, you know, sort of your medicine systems, human resources, information, governance. But in saying that, financing is absolutely crucial. And if you don't get the financing right, you can forget it. And one thing that we're learning, and this has been quite a controversial topic over the years, where we've had all these battles over things like healthcare user fees, um, but there is a realization around the world now that a market-driven 
health financing system, when people buy and sell health services like they would other services, like buying a restaurant meal or something, that never reaches universal health coverage. And that's really because you, the, the cross subsidies don't work at scale. You know, rich people occasionally may be helping other people out in a charitable way. It just will not re, um, get the subsidies that, um, you know, that poor people will get heart transplants and, and, and things like that. It has to be the state has to force healthy, wealthy people to cross subsidize the sick and the poor. And that automatically leads you towards a publicly financed health system. And the state being involved in all the aspects of health financing from raising the revenues and that being done equitably. Um, so, you know, richer people paying in more to pooling those resources into a big pot of funds, but then allocating that to the, you know, the most needy. So it's not a case of if you pay more money in, you get more services out. No, that doesn't work. It's got to be rich people subsidizing the poor. And really what that requires is replacing private voluntary financing. So people choosing whether they buy services for themselves and their families and their friends with compulsory public financing. Now, moving towards a public finance system like that is massively political, as every country has shown, and even to sustain it, uh, is a very political process as well. Now, this graph sort of illustrates the, the, the journey that countries are taking. So it's a, a graph showing uh, public health spending as a share of GDP uh, going across the, the x-axis. And you can see towards the right there, you've got countries that are spending, you know, eight, nine, 10% of GDP, maybe a bit more in some cases. And these are countries you associate with having universal health coverage systems, Japan, New Zealand, Australia. Um, now what that means is, is it takes the financing burden off the, the household. So you can see that as a share of uh, total health expenditure, the out-of-pocket spending is quite low in those countries, you know, you know typically less than 20%. At the other end of the, the spectrum, as it were, at the other end of the graph, you've got countries where public spending is very low and people basically having to pay for services just buying them over the counter in Cambodia, Bangladesh, India, uh, Pakistan. And they are the countries that sort of embarking on their UHC journeys. And the graph is almost exactly the same for Africa as well. In, in Africa, you've got Nigeria top left with very low levels of public spending, but then other countries like South Africa uh, doing better further down the graph. And what's interesting about this transition is that countries can move quite quickly down this graph. You don't, it's not a slow slide down it. You find countries suddenly injecting public financing in their system to specifically take the burden off the households. And you know, one very much associates that with a UHC transition that like Thailand did in, in 2002. And I'll come on to describe that in a moment. And well, here, here shows that, you know, that this uh, in, a, in a different way. Now, these are some of these countries looking at their GDP public health spend over time. And you can see that Pakistan and India are just flatlined at less than 1%. They've gone nowhere, basically. But some of these other Asian countries at other times have suddenly put quite a lot of money in. You know, Thailand in 2001 and then again in 2006, six seven. China, a spectacular increase in, in funding from 2007. Um, you know, the, the, the increase there represents hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Enormous increase in public financing. So it shows it can be done. You know, the, this idea that you can't suddenly ramp up public financing isn't true. And these countries have chosen to do this. And of course, what it takes, I'm not sure if you can see my little arrow, uh, you know, here from a mouse. What it takes is political commitment. You know, the, these big increases are when a government says, okay, we're gonna get serious. And the question is, how do we catalyze this in these other countries? So if you're going to, to do this and you're going to sort of really go for UHC, what are sort of the key steps that you need to take? Now, unfortunately, I haven't got time to go into all these in detail. So it's gonna look like a bit of a gallop. But the point I'm trying to make is actually, theoretically, it's quite straightforward. What you do is you go for full population coverage. You, you don't want a system that some people are covered and some aren't. 
and a fragmented system of different insurance schemes. It's very important politically that everyone feels they get covered. To do that, you typically need to suddenly plug in about 1% of GDP to get started. You'll need more after than that, but about 1% of GDP. You scrap user fees. User fees are a terrible way to finance a health system and taking the financial burden off everyone is a very good way to stimulate demand. You prioritize PHC services over inpatient hospital services. We all know this is where we get our best buys and it's you know, providing services close to where people live. You need to recruit, reimburse and supervise your human resources. You need to recruit more staff, pay them well and train them well. Um, you know, that's obviously a vital system you've got to get right. Likewise, you need to ensure a good availability of essential medicines and commodities and that they are also available free at the point of delivery. Also, you would need to increase service availability. There's you know, no point doing this in the big cities if, if people are living in rural areas, they, they, they won't get the services. So you, that gets rid of geographical barriers. And there again, you invest in things like primary health care centres and community health workers that are a very effective way to increase coverage. And you also need to improve your information and governance systems to make sure that everyone's complying by the rules. So you can see, you know, conceptually, it's pretty straightforward. And this is what a number of these countries like Thailand, Sri Lanka have, have done. Now, um, here's, here's a photo that some of you may have seen before, if I, you've seen one of my presentations, because I usually use it, um, just showing how quickly these reforms can work and how you can, uh, by doing things like removing user fees and improving the supply side, generate big surges in demand for services. And this is what politicians like to see. You know, this, this is an introduction of free healthcare in Sierra Leone in 2010. And you can see the people, you know, these pregnant women and children trying to get into the children's hospital just after the president had launched free healthcare. Now, the, it was very important. It was the president who did that. And, you know, for, for the latter part of uh, my, my talk now, I want to emphasize what we should be doing is pitching this to political leaders. They're the ones who are going to come up with the money. And so um, they're the ones we should be selling this to. In that previous slide, it was the president of Sierra Leone on Independence Day launching free health care for mums and kids. Uh, here are two other well-known UHC heroes. Tommy Douglas, the greatest ever Canadian, voted by the Canadian public, brought UHC to Canada. And Nye Bevan there on the, on the right, in that very famous photograph at the birth of the NHS, launching the NHS and you can see that you know politicians like doing this because it makes them very popular. This is the Prime Minister of Thailand in 2002 who did you know ignored World Bank advice, ploughed about half percent of GDP into his health system and launched the UC scheme and it was very popular. Uh, here's another in interesting example this is Indonesia where the, the then governor of uh, Jakarta, Jokowi, launched a scheme providing people with universal free health care in uh, 2012 and this propelled him up the political uh, spectrum in fact i'm not sure if you can still see i've actually got one of his cards here um you know introducing universal free health care in jakarta and uh, then very soon after in the presidential election announced that he was going to do this nationwide now, someone who's recognised the importance of talking to politicians is Dr. Tedros. He's come to become DG of WHO on a UHC platform. He's a politician himself, and he's going around talking to politicians as much as possible. And, but why is he doing this? Why is it important to engage political leaders, and how do we sell it to them? Well, as I said, you, know, you, you need a big, big injection of public financing to, you know, to do this properly. And... Typically, ministries of finance don't like spending money on health. They need to be told to by the head of state, just like we saw in the UK in the summer when the government needed to buy some political capital and there was a big row between Hunt and Hammond. And Theresa May said, give them what, we, give them what they want. We're going to head for this Brexit nightmare this, this Christmas. So uh, you, you can see it was a head of state issue. Now, why do politicians want this? because they want power. I mean, I know it sounds a blind obvious thing to say, but we need to be sort of pitching, you know, the benefits to them uh, to say, 
well, there are votes in this, you know, this will get results quickly. This is popular and people will understand it. So the, this is the type of language we need to be selling the benefits to, to political leaders and involving um, CSOs, trades unions and the media and thinking about when's the best timing to do this, often in, say, the run-up to elections. Now, this sort of takes a lot of health people outside their comfort zone, really, who are used to just talking about health systems. But if we're going to sell UHC effectively, this is the type of stuff we need to be doing. Now, looking ahead to you know, some examples of some countries where there are interesting things going on, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India, just at the beginning of this year, suddenly launched massive UHC reforms, uh, claiming it's going to cover half a billion people through Modi care. Problem is, it's only really covering people against inpatient hospital care. So there are major concerns about what's going on in India. And, and um, you know, I personally don't think the Modi care reforms are, are, are very well designed. Um, an alternative approach uh, in India is the Delhi state government are actually providing universal free health care through primary health care centres called Mahala Clinics. And these are proving very popular, very effective. This is a photo of two of the elders in a Mahala clinic. Um, but this is a really hot political issue in India between the opposition and the central government. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see how this pans out over the next year or so. Um, an interesting country, and you might be thinking, why on earth are we talking about the United States? Why aren't we just talking about developing countries? Well, I suppose when it comes to health reforms, the United States is a, is a, is a developing country. Um, Obama made great strides, um, you know, sort of to make health care mandatory, health insurance mandatory. Trump's obviously been trying to blow this up in coming into power, but not really, you know, making much progress. And the, the American health system is performing very badly at the moment. And many are seeing this as an opportunity, actually, to promote UHC in the United States. Uh, this is Bernie Sanders, but with uh, Elizabeth Warren, who's one of the front runners to um, challenge Trump in 2020 on a UHC platform. Um, there's another example here. This is the brand new governor of California, who's been elected with the backing of the nurses union to bring UHC to California. So I, I think, you know, there's a very good case for uh, organizations like results, like all of us to be engaging in the battle of the U.S., because if the US can crack this, not only will this be good for the American people, but then hopefully they'll stop polluting the world with their private health insurance. And just to illustrate, um, you know, how things are changing in the US, these are the, the latest bookies odds on who's going to um, fight the 2020 election. Uh, not surprisingly, sort of, it trumps the favourite at the, at the moment because, you know, he, he's likely to be the, the Republican candidate. But these are all uh, Democrats who are uh, avowed uh, single payer UHC advocates who are going to challenge him in, in 2020. I realize I've just got a couple more minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll crack on. Um, now, a big country to watch is Kenya. Tomorrow is going to launch UHC reforms in four counties. Um, this was a meeting that the president chaired only uh, a sort of few weeks ago, and they've announced that they're going to be much more ambitious than we thought in providing universal free health care in these four counties and not expecting any households to make uh, contributions to the insurance, which is great. It seems that, you know, Kenya is on, on a good track there. Um, will Nigeria do something similar next year? You know, I must say that President Bahari hasn't really done much um, you know, in his term of office. But there's an election next year in Nigeria. It's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens there. And another very interesting country to watch. I'm much more optimistic what's happening in South Africa, where President Ramaphosa, just in the last month, has taken the UHG reforms into the presidency. It's giving it a lot more attention. And there are signs that he too is going to go for a much bolder approach to use tax financing to cover the entire population. So last slide, just, to, just in time. Um, and I think, you know, what we're finding is that, that uh, UHC, okay, you've got to get your, your systems right, but really it's as much political as it is technical. And especially concerning switching to an equitable public financing system. It's one of the hottest political issues in the US, 
and at all income levels it's the same. The great thing is, is the UHC as a, as a brand, as a concept, is popular with people and politicians across the world. They understand it. And what's great, it brings politics into health systems debates. And we need this. You, you sometimes hear people say, oh, we, should, we shouldn't you know, have politics involved in the NHS. That's absolute nonsense. That's the only way we're going to get what we want at the end of the day. Um, I think, though, that, that global health generally isn't very good at engaging in the politics. Some NGOs are better than others, but a lot of the big agencies like the World Bank, WHO, the moment things start getting a bit political, they dive under the table. And we need to get these agencies much more engaged in the political economy of UHC. And as we do this, we need to be thinking about promoting the economic benefits to finance ministers in terms of growth and reducing inequalities and reducing poverty. But also, perhaps our trump card is to sell the political benefits to the politicians, the heads of state. And if they don't listen, we should be talking to the opposition leaders and suggesting that if they get their act together, one day they might be president. So that's it. Thank you very much. That was excellent, Rob. Thank you so much. And I think for kind of what we do at Results, eh, we, it's very easy to get down a bit of a sometimes a technical, but Results is built on building the kind of the public and political will. So we have that here in the UK and it's really interesting to hear how that's kind of playing out across countries um, all over the world. And to take my chair's prerogative, it speaks very true to what we're hearing from the UK government just now, who said to me in a meeting last week, about kind of UHC and the high level meeting which is coming up in September that that meeting can't be about health and I was like how can you have a UHC meeting that's not about health but they're like it has to speak politically so heads of state want to um want to engage in this and show why it matters to them and their population so um it's great and I'm really glad to see there's alignment between what you're saying around political will and what we do at results mm. That was good. Um, so before we move to questions, and I see some from Jill, we'll make sure you have um, Rob's Twitter handle. Um, I can firmly agree that there are lots of good updates very regularly on his Twitter. Um, we'll pass to Jenny to give us a bit of a different perspective, because I think UHC is this big umbrella and covers a lot of different things. But you know, if we're you know talking about the one in 10 kids who don't get vaccinated, are the millions of kids, um, kids or, or people who are still dying from infectious diseases, how do we still make sure that we're not kind of deprioritizing that for a huge big system that might take years to um, come to fruition? Um, so in that, I'm going to pass over to um, Jenny, um, just for that simple question. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the simple question, Laura. Um, I'm not going to put my webcam on just because it's not working very well. So hopefully you'll all um, be okay listening to my voice for the next 10 minutes. Um, I'm just going to start, dive straight in because I realise that we're um, short of time. Um, and yeah, I really hope that I can unpack some of these questions that we want to see answers to. But I think that you'll hear a very strong political thread um, right through what I have to say um, and of obviously speaking from Strap AIDS um, it's going to be very much framed through a HIV lens but I'll in my concluding statements I hope you see like the, the wider health agenda as well. Um, so just for a little bit of background Strap AIDS is a network organization made up of 17 members um, we've been working uh, for about 30 years to advocate for a strong resourced HIV response within the UK with the UK government um, and our strategy splits our work into two main areas they are HIV prioritization and HIV integration and into in integration we focus on areas where HIV overlaps and intersects with other health issues or where we believe that there are lessons that could be learned and applied to other areas from the HIV response and this is very relevant to our UHC work. Um, our usual areas of focus on our integration work are access to medicines, which is a cornerstone of UHC that Rob's mentioned, sustainability and transitions, and then we also work on issues including LGBT rights, tuberculosis, women and girls, and young people. So I'll be framing this presentation around our experience at Stop AIDS of of kind of encounter, encountering and intertwining ourselves within the UHC agenda. And I'm going to focus on how Stop AIDS is including HIV within UHC in all of our advocacy work to end AIDS by 2030, and how within this we are making the case for the linkages between HIV and UHC in the wider agenda. 
So we believe that if approached strategically, the whole SDG agenda, including UHC, which is a target within goal three of the SDGs, can significantly benefit people living with and affected by HIV. So both the UHC and the AIDS response, we think, share really common goals around equity, uh, non-discrimination, dignity and social justice and these are things which like the horizontal and the vertical health, um, health campaigners very much hopefully have in common and should really be kind of synthesized around. Um, the renewed movement for the quality of health is reminiscent of all the efforts that changed the history of HIV and linking HIV treatment and prevention to UHC also enables us to take a hard look at like the pervasive inequalities to, in access to services which will need to be conquered to not only aid, end AIDS but also to achieve UHC. I think this is kind of the key point and hopefully speaks very clearly to what I've been asked to present on. Um, so back to the political, universal health coverage is also presented um, as an important opportunity to repoliticize health through a focus on vulnerability and inequality and bring visibility to the holistic needs of individuals and communities. And we very much welcome this positioning at Stop AIDS um, because in our experience as the most marginalized and key populations, and by that I mean sex workers, people that use drugs, men who have sex with men and transgender people are the ones who are most consistently uh, left out and discriminated against when, where we need to focus and where we need to focus most of our attention. So I'm going to start by giving a brief introduction to some kind of UHC and HIV topics and then I'm going to go into a slightly deeper dive um, on some of these areas. So um, uh, try and be brief but during the SDG negotiation process there were kind of two schools of thought about having a, a, the goal three and whether UHC should be the goal or whether we should have a health goal that integrated um, both UHC and HIV. Um, as we know the second school of thought prevailed and UHC like HIV was included as a target under the overarching SDG health goal. Um, so we really welcome that and we think that HIV and UHC should be approached as a shared agenda to maximise efficiencies and impact and build on each other's strengths. Um, we think that UHC can support sustainable progress within the HIV response if HIV is included in the essential packages of services provided as part of UHC and if marginalised groups are most affected by HIV are covered by UHC. And we think this inclusion of HIV in UHC is critical because people who are most affected by HIV often have the least ability to pay for services. So going back to those financial points that uh, Rob was making at the beginning of his um, uh, presentation. But we also know that HIV services are cost effective and that there are very clear public health benefits for the wider population when the HIV response is well financed. We also think that the UHC movement can learn a lot from the HIV response. So for example, in the area of access to medicines, which I'll come on to later. And finally, we see HIV as an entry point to achieving UHC. So I'll just give you one example um, from Ethiopia's health extension program, where funding from HIV investments recruited, trained and supported over 35,000 rural community health workers um, and help to them to provide sustainable comprehensive primary health care so um, often investing in HIV is then an avenue into investing into UHC so I'm gonna move on to a slightly deeper dive in what we can learn from the successes of the HIV response first and then I'm going to talk about some specific issues um, so again the political from the start we think that HIV has been successfully framed as a political issue and this is like key to the response so the movement engaged with politicians with ministers with civil society and promote inclusive governance and partnership with communities. From day one, civil society and communities have demanded access to HIV treatment and services, calling up for human rights of people to be respected, calling for community-led responses, and involving people living with HIV. So the kind of nothing about us without us approach has proven crucial um, to delivering more, re more responsive programs and therefore better results. So we think that is kind of really, really crucial. We also think the role of civil society in the, in the HIV response has been crucial and it will be to the UHC um, response as well. Um, uh, civil society is both a provider of services and as a kind of an advocacy stakeholder um, representing the needs and the asks of the most marginalised. But we think that um, UHC is still too public health system focused, facility based and doctor dependent. So the, the HIV sector has many lessons um, in terms of task shifting with communities and the critical role of communities in providing services to the most marginalised advocating for the promotion of human rights, as I said, addressing stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings. And UHC is also very treatment focused. Um, and this, I think Rob like, highlighted this very early on in his, present his presentation, but it can't just be about treatment. It needs to be about prevention. It needs to be about care. It needs to be about the longer term things. Um, so yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on because I'm very conscious of time. So um, one area that we think that UHC can help to deliver the end of AIDS, help us to deliver the end of AIDS, is by increasing equity 
equitable innovation sorry equitable research and development innovation and access to medicines so achieving uhc requires access to affordable medicines and vaccines um, and to bring this into the uk government for example uh, the uk context for example um, the uk government is the second largest funder country for research and development globally into diseases that predominantly affect low and middle income countries but many products created are unaffordable because of the system which we use to create those medicines and allows pharmaceutical companies to charge high prices um, so we think that in the UHC agenda, we have a really uh, strong opportunity to set down some new rules of the game around, for example, medical R&D that would allow us to get better access um, to medicines. We also think that um, it can help us deal more squarely with the issues around determinants of health, including human rights. Um, so as I've mentioned, human rights are of particular importance to the HIV response because HIV disrespo disproportionately affects those key populations. So it's vital that these groups are reached by UHC in order to ensure that no one is left behind. And as part of this, we need to remember that the availability of services doesn't equate to those services being accessed. So we want to see the UHC movement not only supporting sustained coverage, but increased coverage. And we think that those are very two distinct things. But if we think that cam if campaigners can make those arguments and make them strongly, um, then we can really secure progress there. Um, we really want to see greater and more integrated services. And finally, we think it can really help us with the sustainable financing landscape. And like Rob's talk and talked a bit about this in terms of um, uh, you know, where different countries are at with their ability to mobilise their own resources to pay for UHC. What some countries can do is obviously different to the ability of other countries. Um, so we really want to see a kind of meaningful inclusion of commitments and targets within the language that comes out of the UHC HLM about countries' ability to pay support for countries who can't, who can't do that yet, but need, need that extra help in being able to figure out, you know, their tax systems, sort out their debt burden requirements, um, so that we can really Really like pay for those services um, that they do that they do need um, and finally um, just before I wrap up I just wanted to spend a minute highlighting a challenge that I think that we face um, and there's are uh, there are really a lot um, but I just thought that one is which is particularly cross-cutting in the UHC and HIV space. So um, we think that measurement of UHC is really difficult. Um, and despite many efforts, there's no real agreed set of concrete indicators. We have um, really useful indicators in the HIV response. We have the 1990-90 targets, for example, that really allow us to scrutinize and hold governments to account. But at the moment, we don't have the same in the UHC response. And I think this, again, is something the campaigners should really be pushing for, similarly to how we uh, we push for so much um, accountability to be built into the tuberculosis high level meeting. Um, but yeah, so we have concerns that some existing attempts um, at implementing UHC have only delivered an essential, pa essential or basic passage of package of services that cuts out expensive or politically unpopular services. And those can include the things that we need the most. So the things like HIV services for men who have sex with men, the, the least popular people in society, the people the government doesn't care about their votes, you know, all, all these kind of multiple um, lines of discrimination affecting them but we really believe that unless these critical sectors have strong in uh, have this kind of strong inclusion um, then we won't really see UHC as we mean it um, as activists um, and as stop aids so a very small conclusion um, the achievement of UHC and the end of AIDS are inextricably I can't say this word inextricably there you go um, interrelated we basically can't have one without the other and this rings true across so many other so-called vertical health issues um, that we are so used to talking about in the global health space. So being mindful of our interconnected global health arena in all the commitments that we make in our UHC uh, advocacy and all the commitments that we, that we call for is vital. And I'll stop there. And I see that I've stimulated a lot of discussion. <laughs> apologies. No, no apologies at all, Jenny. That was fantastic. And thanks to both kind of you and Rob for such comprehensive overviews of I think, I think what you've really described is in some way it's really simple because we know how we need to get there. We've got evidence of how to do that. But the complexities of balancing that with the challenges and a, a huge list that you list off there, Jenny, around inclusion, access, price, um, R&D, so many different elements that isn't just like in a one size fits all for everyone. So I really thank you both for that um, comprehensive overview and I would actually really like to see you both debate on some of that but um, I'm going to pass it over to our, um, which maybe we should put that in the diary for the new year, but pass it over to our, uh, our grassroots kind of volunteers and uh, people who are dialing in from 
all around the world to see kind of what are their reflections, what questions do they have for um, for you both as our experts on the call and we've got just about 15 minutes so if everyone could keep their um, questions um, quite short and if we can keep answers quite short we'll try and fit in as many as possible so um, results knowledge do you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question or would you like me to yeah okay then yes um, yes <laughs> go ahead uh, thanks Robert and Jenny very interesting to, to hear your points of view on that uh, just a couple of questions. One for you, Robert. I was reading uh, a while back about Ro was it Rwanda yeah. and how they've managed to um, get, uh, facilitate 90% of health care coverage for being quite a poor country. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if you had any information on that. And also just to Jenny, like, I work um, in the health service myself and I don't know what you think about better global education about HIV and its treatment. Like, I, I regularly, even now, still have discussions with people who just assume that HIV is basically um, a drug associated with, uh, with, with homosexuals and, um, and, it, and it doesn't affect uh, heterosexuals. And I just think to myself, what year am I living in? You know, was it, and do you think this, this, this should, to basically just reduce the stigma regarding this so people actually, actually know what we're actually dealing with? It's, it's something very, very important. And, um, uh, and personally, I just think that People should know this in the, in the in 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 this year. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Jenny and Rob, do you want to go ahead, and then we've got questions coming in thick and fast to jump to after that. Shall I go first? Because I feel like maybe mine's a, a bit more of a, a a rounded answer that I can give, and then we can go back to the UHC more generally. I think um, yes, we definitely need better global education about HIV treatment. That is an easy answer um, to give you, and maybe a frustrating one. Um, and I yeah, I share your I share your frustration with the year that the year and the time that we're in i think you know there is a large uh, swathe of campaigning now um around initiatives like u equals u which is um undetectable equals untransmittable which is this um thing where if you know people living with hiv are on effective treatment and they have a certain virus if they if they're if that treatment is taking effect within their body and they are healthy, then they are unable to pass the virus on. And I think that's a really kind of useful message that we need to be sharing and we need to be explaining to people. Um, I think obviously the way that HIV has affected those key populations that I listed, including men who have sex with men, um, you know, is is kind of uh, something that we we really need to grapple with. Um, but you're exactly right to say, you know, this this disease is agnostic. It can and will affect anybody that it comes into contact with. Um, and the lack of education around that, um, you know, both the silly things that you hear about how it's transmitted. And then on the flip side, the fact that there just isn't enough information about how it's really transmitted and how to protect yourself, um, again, is extremely frustrating. But I, um, if you want to know more in the domestic context, um, results Norwich sorry I don't know your name then I can support um in linking up with you uh, linking you up with some kind of more educative HIV charities in the UK that's great uh, thanks um Jenny and over to you Rob and I'll, I'll give you prerogative as well if there's anything specifically came out of the vertical horizontal um, kind of discussion we're happening that you'd like to mention as well uh, yeah, sure. I, well, you know, to deal first with the the issue of Rwanda, and you're absolutely right that Rwanda's done very well. Um, now, interestingly, this was initially sold as a, a great success of voluntary health insurance, but that's not true at all. That the, the Rwanda has managed to get people sort of covered um, by having um, a scheme that's basically compulsory insurance. So, so it's a publicly financed health system that's massively subsidised. The bottom forty percent don't pay anything. Uh, the next sort of tier pay only, only a sort of a tokenary amount. And so it's been a very successful example of a publicly financed health system. Uh, it's unfortunate that some people have put this out as a success of private voluntary insurance. It's just not true. And they had about 20% budget share at one point, you know, sort of, and, you know, they've invested in primary health care, community health workers. They've, they've done a cracking job. So, I mean, it just shows that what can be done with public financing and, and, and political commitment, really. And on the vertical horizontal thing, I, I completely sort of agree with, um, you know, what Jenny was sort of saying about uh, the how, what lessons we can learn from HIV uh, for UHT. You know, the tremendous political battles fought over things like access to medicines, 
got so much to learn and so much to thank the HIV community for, I think, in, in showing us some of the tricks to get things onto the agenda of political leaders. And uh, a lot of my work involves sort of trying to encourage different sort of vertical programs to recognize that, you know, that we're better off within the UHC tent. You know, it's a case of united we, we stand, divided we fall. And, that, you know, if all the sort of different horizontal problems are going to the Ministry of Finance and the President say, no, don't listen to the NCD people, put all your money into this, that, and the other, you know, it just doesn't look good. Um, but if we can package it all up as UHC and people getting all the health services they need for all their major health priorities, then that's much better all round. But of course, we've got to recognise there will still be political competition from within that, you know, between, say, hospital services, and mental health services, and, and you, you name it. You know, let, let's not by, be naive about this. But, you know, um, we can argue about the slices of cake afterwards. But I think UHT is all about getting a nice big fat cake from the Ministry of Finance to fight over. Yeah, great analogy going into Christmas, where I'm sure there's going to be <laughs> fat cakes. Um, we've got two other questions come in um, on the chat box. Um, Corinne and Reese, do you want to speak up and ask your questions? Or if you can't unmute, um, I can ask them. And if anyone else wants to um, jump in just now, let's do that and we'll take all the questions together. Hi, Rob. Uh, Corinne here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, that's Corinne. Uh, you mentioned Well, I can't hear you now. Oh. Uh, can you hear now? Yes, that's a bit better, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned Nigeria has maybe some developments with UHC. What other countries do you feel might be on the cusp? Oh, there are lots. And they, and they tend to be sort of middle income, lower middle income countries that, you know, that uh, have been poor performers. And, and uh, you know, seeing some very exciting things happening in India, not necessarily good, you know, for the national reforms, but some of the state level reforms are good. Uh, Pakistan, is a, um, you know, they've got a new prime minister now who's uh, said he's going to do big things on health. And again, Pakistan could be doing a lot better. Um, Indonesia, jokowi has got to finish the job. He's got to about 70% coverage. He's got an election coming up next year. I know the elders have been talking to Jokowi a lot about you know, doing the, you know, finishing the job off and, and plowing about 1% of GDP into the health system. In Africa, South Africa, definitely worth watching. Kenya is going to kick off tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm not very optimistic about Nigeria. It ought to, because it's performed so badly um, and it's for its income level, should be doing a lot better. But, but uh, who knows, you know, if, if there's a change of president, you know, then, then um, you know, maybe it might suddenly change there. And that's the exciting thing about this stuff. And, you know, a country can look to be not really doing much. Uh, and then it really kicks off. And the United States, you wait for 2020 presidential election. It is going to be massive. And I, I personally think that the U.S. is going to move to a publicly financed health system in the next decade. So that, that will be fantastic. So the loads, basically. Yeah, that's really exciting. And maybe if we do a good job as advocates, we can create some more of that political momentum um, in, in New York in September. Um, we had one question in from Reese on the chat box. Um, do you want to go ahead, Reese? Hi, guys. Um, thank Hello. you for your presentations. Yeah, so my question basically is around how I can get involved. Essentially, I'm a pharmacy undergrad at the minute, and I've been to various international things now I went to Serbia and spoke about it there in the FIP Congress mm -hmm. uh, which is in Scotland and it's a big issue the SDGs got mentioned a lot and it's a big thing personally for me so looking to move more into the kind of health economics field post-grad what sort of things should I be doing now do you think or could I be doing now to kind of raise awareness and push this forward if you guys have any suggestions please where do you go to uni Reese? Uh, in Birmingham Nice. That's where I went. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, I would say 
you know, uh, speaking from a personal perspective as a semi young advocacy professional, um, you know, I like my path was very much through being involved in student activism on campus and then building it up. And there's a couple of societies um, who you, you might be able you might be able to make some good links with. One of them is called um, Universities for Allied Essential Medicines, UAEM, they're known as. Um, I would recommend getting in getting in touch with them if they're on campus at Birmingham. I'm not actually not sure if they are, um, but they do a lot of work uh, specifically in the kind of more pharmaceutical space on um, uh, like how medicine how medical technology is transferred from universities into pharmaceutical companies which is extremely interesting if you work on access to medicines um, and then uh, plug from Stop AIDS is that we have our own youth campaigning network called Youth Stop AIDS uh, aptly named I'm sure you can agree um, and we work on missing medicines as well um, but yeah, I think there's probably a lot. I mean, they're the kind of more student opportunities and then maybe Rob can, can give you some that are more, I don't know, uni universally well-known. And yeah, well, thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I think what, you know, one thing is, is that there is a chronic shortage of health economists working on health financing in developing countries. I mean, it's quite astonishing. I mean, a lot of health economists end up working for pharmaceutical companies. And, and so... It's a really great sort of career move and, and, you know, an obvious way into it. I don't know how practical it would be for you to do this is to do a master's in health economics. You know, there are a number of schools that do it. You know, there's a very famous one at York University, uh, Aberdeen, uh, London uh, do uh, health economics. And then there's an absolutely fabulous scheme run by the ODI, the ODI fellowship scheme, where they sort of put uh, young uh, sort of master's students, they place them in ministries of health in developing countries and, and really an amazing job because you know, so you, you'll find yourself in a planning department doing things like allocating the health budget and, and sort of you know, helping uh, you know, officials to do that. And over the years I've met so many people who have done that ODI fellowship, having done a master's in health economics. Uh, so that's a very good route if, if you're interested. You know, look out for those two things. Yeah, I think I should maybe do one of those courses as well. Um, yeah, um, amen to that. Yeah, um, we have a few minutes left, and I just wonder if anyone on the phone uh, wants to jump in with um, and squeeze in a final last uh, question or two. No, otherwise I might use a kind of cheers prerogative. No. Okay, so final final question to you kind of Rob and Jenny and kind of as close to one sentence um, as you can get. What are your hopes for the, the, um, the high level meeting which is taking place in September next year and what can, you know, our, our volunteers and great kind of grassroots advocates here in the UK um, do to help make a difference? For me, the, the, you know, the prerequisites for, for UHC are a political commitment from the head of state. All the best UHC reforms are led by heads of state, really. So, so uh, uh, heads of state announcing that they are going to do UHC reforms and committing their government to ramp up public spending. Because there's a lot of talk often about, oh, yes, I'm committed to UHC, but then then nothing happens. And really, they need to put the money where their mouths are. And, and um, it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, Modi's talk to, talking about sort of doubling public spending in India. Um, will he do that in the next year's budget? So I, I'd like to see some accountability, really, with, with politicians. A, say they're going to do it. B, saying they're going to put, put the money in. And then we all go back and say, well, did they do it? Are they putting the money in? And for me, that you know, it's a very, very straightforward way to start UHC reforms. And that, you know, that would sort of cut through maybe sort of through uh, some of the nonsense that's spoken about it. And we can really hold them to account. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks, Rob. And Jenny, very quickly. What yeah, do you I think for me, I mean, obviously the money's the money is vital, but the the where that money goes is is even more important i think and getting some solid commitments into this uhc hlm outcome document that really um you know affirm human rights that um talk about access that talk about dignity that, so, that talk about social justice that talk about equity i think that that is the foundation from which we need to be building this movement i think if we skip that we might end up with a version of uhc that sounds like it's uhc on paper but in reality just isn't delivering for people that need it so i think i would um encourage 
encourage everybody to kind of unite behind campaigning uh, that's calling for that kind of meaningful text inclusion. Um, and yeah, get talking to your parliamentarians. Mm. Yeah, they're um, fantastic points to end on. And I think sometimes in Global Health, we talk a lot about who's missing. And I certainly feel a real sense of optimism that there are changes happening around the world as possible. And, you know, what we need to do is just work with the global partners we have to make sure politically we are driving those commitments to quality care, have a list of all those things you mentioned, Jenny, but also have the financial commitments behind it as well. Um, and Jill, yes, there's work on um, indicators and will certainly be part of um, our advocacy at results as well. Um, so I just want to say a massive big thank you to our speakers. Um, Rob and Jenny, you've been fantastic and given us lots to think about. Thank you to everyone for um, giving up your evening so close to Christmas. Um, hope you didn't have to miss any Christmas parties. Enjoying it, but I made it as festive as I possibly could for you all. Um, and I think we really, really look forward to here at Results um, and through Navid and the grassroots team, really looking forward to um, really following on this conversation throughout 2019 and really looking at what role the UK can play and um, us as, as grassroots volunteers or as results staff members um, to make sure that we get the commitments and the results we want for the people who deserve access to the, all the essential health services um, that we know work and can um, give them a much better quality of life. So thank you, I'll sign off. Merry Christmas, everyone. Um, yeah. I hope you have a good couple of weeks and I'll see you in the new year. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.